Outside consumer electronics and car companies from Japan, Mitsui is one of the best known Japanese companies in my country, in Australia. There are lots of people who've come to study in Japan with scholarships from Mitsui. Uh, Mitsui has been a real pioneer in the large scale commodity trades in Australia, iron ore, coal, and a whole range of other minerals that were absolutely fundamental to Japan's post-war development. So in a, a state like Western Australia, for example, which uh, overwhelmingly depends on major minerals exports, and particularly iron ore, Mitsui is one of the most influential companies, without doubt, in the Australian context. And Mitsui has recognised that as well. That's one reason why it was so active from the late 1960s on in promoting cultural exchange between uh, Japan and Australia, providing scholarships, for example, for students to come to Japan, to get to know more about Japan, and it has also been a very significant player in sponsoring things like art exchange and whatnot. We need to ask ourselves, of course, what is the, the key thing that the big trading companies do? Well, they obviously trade. Uh, we'll talk in uh, other contexts, in class and in other videos, about the particular role of the trading companies as part of the large pre-war zaibatsu, the large industrial and business conglomerates that were centered on a particular holding company, which after the war, by the way, holding companies were banned as a way of democratizing Japanese economy and more recently have been liberalized. But the trading companies provided a kind of one-stop shop for these large industrial conglomerates, uh, everything that was pretty much done internationally. So all of the major Zaibatsu groups, post-war they became Keiretsu, each had their core general trading company. They do a whole range of things. They would source a wide range of needed raw materials from abroad. They would carry out basic trading functions, the export and import capabilities, because there's a lot of fundamental paperwork and financing and whatnot. They had particular expertise in that. Later on, they became significant procurers of technologies. And so a significant part of all the trading companies is to actually have a license business. Uh, they're very good in terms of the basic law of licensing technology, for example, licensing brands. We see some trading companies such as Itochu having a very substantial fashion brand licensing business. So lots of people, for example, who are interested in uh, the fashion industry and particularly in foreign brands coming to Japan would choose to work for a trading company such as Itochu. Now, Mitsui is, is particularly strong in the commodities trade. And part of the feature of the large scale commodities trade is that you often also take direct investments in projects, not a controlling stake, but a minority stake, somewhere between five to 10, up to 15%, um, investing in, for example, a coal mine, an iron ore mine, smelter, that's processing facilities, um, and even key infrastructure, export port terminals and whatnot. But particularly taking an equity stake in a minerals project is significant. And why would they do this? Well. Partly it puts them on both sides of the transaction. They're a customer, but also they're on the selling side, which means that as a key stakeholder, as a shareholder, as a part owner in the business, you actually are likely to get access to more information about the real cost structure, for example, of the project, and that helps uh, underpin your own negotiating position as a buyer. But also it really fundamentally signals your intention to be a long-term customer of that project. We must remember that large uh, resources projects, for example, in Australia and inland Australia or remote parts of Western Australia, it's not just a huge hole in the ground. You actually have to build the critical infrastructure, the railway connections, the port facilities to be able to get those raw materials on the ships and to get them to Japan. Literally billions of dollars involved. And they typically have a 20 to 30 year life. And as a consequence, what you need to see is stable supplier relationships, stable buyers, stable customers. And so a typical feature of the industry is long-term contracts. You don't contract for 20 years for a certain fixed price. Uh, you normally have pricing for a couple of years out with some mechanism for adjustment in light of what we call the spot prices, current market prices. But the critical thing is that you enter these long-term indicative contracts to say that we will be a customer for the output of your project for the next 20 years. On the basis of that, 
the miners and the investors, and they have to go to the banks and a whole range of other firms to share the risk because the scale is so large, then have confidence to invest in the project, invest in the infrastructure, and all of the coordinating functions that are going to be needed. Now, it's very easy for a company to say, yeah, don't worry, don't worry, we'll buy for you from 20 years, so go ahead. And of course, the customers would have a powerful incentive to actually encourage too many projects because that would actually lead to Japanese expression kind of from farming, horsaku bimbo, uh, a large uh, excess of supply. If you have an excess of supply, of course, market prices are going to fall. And from a customer side, that would be attractive. So it would be very tempting for the buyers to exaggerate their commitment long term in order to encourage more supply into the market. So to overcome that problem of credibility, effectively the customers post a bond. They make an investment themselves directly in the project which signals that they are serious about it. So in short, a company like Mitsi is very, very good, not just at uh, negotiating prices, coordinating the delivery of the product to their key Japanese clients, whether it's um, steel firms or energy companies or whatever, but they're also really good at investing minority stakes in these projects as bond posting and then longer term managing this portfolio of investments. This, of course, gave them experience when they started to diversify into a whole range of other businesses, including domestic businesses. And for example, Mitsubishi Corporation uh, has been very significant as effectively a venture capitalist, even encouraging their own staff to, to develop, and Mitsubishi has been copying some of those models. So effectively, the trading companies have become huge financial enterprises, something equivalent almost to an investment bank um, internally, and venture, venture capital fund in addition to trading houses. One of the distinctive things too in working for a trading company is that the area you go to work for, your haizoku, where you're assigned to, uh, you often stay there for a very long time. Uh, in, fact, in fact, you can spend your whole career in a certain area. So although they're general trading companies, effectively what happens is many of the staff become highly specialized in a particular commodity. So people might work on iron ore, um, LNG, liquid natural gas, for example, or a particular subset of agricultural commodities over a long period of time. And so they offer uh, specialist expertise and as a consequence, a whole range of domestic companies that need foreign inputs can save themselves the trouble of learning all about how to do that, not only managing the trade, but really tracking markets and whatnot, and, and being in a strong position longer term as a, as a customer in the market. Instead, they can leave it to the major trading companies to do this. And Mitsui is particularly striking, of course, in how it's worked with places like Australia from the mid-1960s, anticipating the huge growth in demand for natural resources that Japan would need to fuel its industrialization post-war.